yeah, it's human nature to want to give in to feel good. It's human nature to discount future rewards. It's human nature to think about future self like a stranger. Now, knowing all that, I think I can beat that. Yeah, I can, I can do things now to win. And winning means living the life I want to win, live. It's, it feels like a constant battle and struggle between the rational mind and then our emotional reptilian brain, uh, as they call it. <laughs> yes. Thank you for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. I, I just wanted to tell you that I'm really passionate about procrastination. And I really feel that if we could give ourselves orders and follow them, the world would just be a completely different place because we often tend mm -hmm. to procrastinate our ideal lives. So last year you were in the face of death. You had a, a scare. Would you mind expanding on that? Sure. Um, yeah, exactly. This time last year, I began radiation treatment for an oral pharyngeal cancer. And uh, this cancer was deep in my throat and also in my lymph glands and my neck. And so I had 35 radiation treatments. Fortunately, I didn't have to have surgery and I declined the chemo, given that it wasn't, it was definitely going to hurt me, but not necessarily benefit me. So it, uh, yeah, as much as uh, I had lots of worries, my health team was great and here I am and I've survived. Now I'm a little worse for the wear. That much radiation going through my head did some damage, left me without saliva glands and without taste right now. The taste might come back if I'm lucky, uh, but I've had to learn to adapt in all sorts of ways that you don't need to hear about, but I'm very, very pleased to still be alive. Yeah, I'm pleased you're alive too. How, how did everything you've learned from researching procrastination over 20 years, I believe, how did you apply that to what was going on? Well, it's interesting, as I listen to you talk about the fact that the world would be a better place if we could, I think you use the word command, uh, <laughs> command ourselves to do things. Uh, it was something with that same sort of force. And, and uh, it, has to, it has to be uh, firm, but it need not be forceful. Uh, and I think that that's what I've learned through my research, but m more importantly, through life, that It reminds me of that old Zen story of the novice who's seeking enlightenment. And he goes to the master and he said, master, what do I do next? And he said, have you finished eating your rice? And he said, yes. And he said, then wash your bowl. And I, I think if we can live like that, we don't need to force ourselves to do anything. We do what's next. Mm -hmm. right? Like you, It isn't so complicated. And what it is for many of us is that we have intentions and goals and plans and ambitions, but when the time comes to do them, our whole body screams, I don't want to, I don't feel like it, I'll feel more like it tomorrow. That's the procrastinator's song, right? And, and that's the problem. And that when, you, when we sing that song, we know that it's about our emotions. I don't feel like it, I don't want to. So it is about dealing with our emotional state. But, you know, a lot of dealing with our emotional state is just to recognize that our brains are meant to do a few things, of course, but also two things. Think and feel, think and feel. Now your brain is more complex than that. <laughs> but it's doing all this thinking and feeling. But lots of it is extraneous. Like We don't have to take it so seriously. If I acted on every thought I had or every feeling I had, I'd be in big trouble. And we are quite predictably irrational, the behavioral economists will tell us, but I'd also say we're quite crazy, right? <laughs> we, we, are, um, we have all these crazy thoughts and feelings and we take them so seriously when we think, say things to ourselves like, I don't want to, I don't feel like it, I need to be in the mood, I need to be motivated. Well, that's just such a myth. And so it really comes down to the simple idea of what's the next thing? Oh, wash my bowl. I think mm -hmm. I will do that. And it's not that I should do it or I have to do it, but that's what I'm going to do. And, and if you, in the best world, I could say I want to, 
But I needn't even do that either because then I'm starting to put a valence on it. I want to do this and I don't want to do that as opposed to what's the next thing to do? Oh, it's this, that I will do it. And I won't make any more of it than that because that's what children do. And I think we act like children. Yeah, in, in lots of ways. What you said is a lot easier said than done that we know what we have to do yet we don't do it and uh, it's an emotional intelligence problem but why knowing what we have to do do we not do it well because the other options are more tempting because they're going to give you reward more quickly typically we prefer the short-term reward sooner and smaller over later and larger. Again, the behavioral economists talk about this as a question of utility, but I don't think it's, a, I don't think that's the place to put the emphasis. There's no doubt that we discount future rewards. Rewards in the future aren't, don't seem as big to us, but I don't think that's where procrastination stems from. Procrastination stems from the misregulation of emotion. We think that by doing some things now to take care of our emotional well-being, we're going to be better off. But in fact, we end up just the opposite because what happens is that we're busy taking care of ourselves, giving in to feel good, taking, taking some temptation. And then later on, we're behind the eight ball because we haven't done our work and there's, no more, there's now more stress and other things aren't getting done. So to be uh, direct to your question again, Why do we do it even though we know all these things? Because the, that reward is so powerful in the short term. It makes sense, doesn't it, to want to have fun now as opposed to uh, later. And that's the, the draw. And we see that in all sorts of areas of our lives. You know, <laughs> most of us are concerned about our health and we know that overeating isn't good for us and overconsumption of sugar. Let's just take those two. And then we find ourselves in the second row of cookies in a bag. Well, you know you're not eating because you're hungry at that point. You're, you're eating for some other reason. And, and most people relate to that quite easily. We, nutritionists have told us for a long time that's called emotional eating. Or my sister has a wonderful term. She calls it retail therapy. Right? <laughs> you go buy yourself a new pair of shoes or whatever. And, and that's okay for my sister. She happens to be quite wealthy. She can do that. But most of us recognize that It, it's short-lived, the high you get from it. And then for many people who don't have that kind of wealth, then they're also spending money they don't have. Oh, spending money they don't have, eating calories they can't afford, or wasting time they can't afford. Do you see the commonality there in that self-regulation problem? Mm -hmm. We want that immediate gratification because we're misregulating our emotions. It's not an under-regulation. And that's where I kind of reacted to your first comment of kind of, commanding ourselves to do the next thing. It's a misunderstanding that we say, um, I don't have to put more willpower to this. I have to recognize that giving in to these temptations now isn't going to make me feel better. And when we get to that state of mind, then oftentimes we can make better choices. Now, that's only one tool in your toolkit. And if that's your only tool, it's going to fall short. But it's a, a fundamental place to start to recognize that procrastination is not a time management problem, it's an emotion management problem. And, and, and the emotional management problem in particular is the misregulation of emotion. You think, oh, I'm just going to make my feel, myself feel better. Of course, I, I deserve that. <laughs> well, you do. But even my students have finally gotten to the point where they say, where do I find the balance, Professor Pitchell? Because I find that when I start taking care of my emotions, the next day I'm in a worse state because I spent all of yesterday just taking care of myself and I got nothing else done. And now I'm stressed out about not getting nothing done. I said, well, exactly. So, you know, that's, that's the story. Now, there's a bunch of things we probably have to put in place to, to make the next steps, but you got to start there. Start recognizing that it's not a time management problem but an emotion regulation problem. And you, in your book, The, the Procrastination Puzzle, you mentioned this very interesting, interesting technique, which you call implementation intention. Would you mind expanding on that technique and maybe other things we could do to better handle our emotions or notice when we're procrastinating? 
Sure. Now, implementation intentions are the work of Peter Galwitzer and his students and colleagues. He's been doing this work since the 90s. And an implementation intention, to define it, I better start by just saying, what's a goal intention? We all have goal intentions, whether it be finish my report or exercise more frequently or stop biting my nails. We can have all sorts of goals. And my goal intention is to achieve that. But an implementation intention is what it sounds like. How am I going to implement that intention? Now, Peter Galwitzer and his colleagues have found that the best format for that is an if-then or when-then statement. So for today, when it's four o'clock, then I'm going to log on to my computer. When then? So that the cue for action is in the environment. I don't have to rely on my internal uh, sources because when I do, I go back to my habits and my habits are typically bad. Instead, I put the cue for action in the environment. When then? So a good example for that in my own life was that I wasn't flossing my teeth very much. I knew I needed to. My dentist told me I had to. But I, honestly, I didn't even couldn't remember it. And then the days I would remember, I'd say, I don't want to. I don't feel like it. <laughs> So instead, I made a simple when-then statement. I already had a toothbrushing habit. I was very good at that. When I pick up my toothbrush, then I'll put the floss on the counter. Simple, right? And, and then when I put down my toothbrush, then I'll pick up the floss. Well, I've never missed a day. Now, it doesn't mean I feel like it. Don't get me wrong. It hasn't changed my internal state. But now at least I've got this cue in my environment that helps me with the prospect of memory, because I'd often forget about it, when then. And it's a very powerful thing to have a schedule stuff. So I think very highly of it, as you saw in that book. But I have a much more powerful technique, and it comes from somebody else. It comes from one of those productivity gurus by the name of David Allen on getting stuff done, getting things done. You know, David Allen makes the astute observation that we don't do projects, we do actions. And that's so important. And I knew that as a psychologist. Early in the game, when I was doing research, I found that once people got started, they didn't have a problem with procrastination. So you saw a chapter in the book that says, just get started. <laughs> and I had people write to me and say, Professor Pitchell, you know, you've been studying this now for <laughs> nearly 25 years. Uh, sir, if I could get started, I wouldn't have a procrastination <laughs> problem. Can't you do any better than that? And I said, yeah, you're right. Like, I get what you're saying. And so I had to go to the wisdom of David Allen and, and go back to the basics and say, yeah, the, the key phrase is, what's the next action? And even in my Zen story of, have, have you finished your rice, then wash your bowl? That's the next action, right? So all throughout the day, when I face a moment, even when I have an implementation intention, right, it's four o'clock or it's, it, uh, I've just finished my coffee or whatever it is you've said as your when, you can still have that internal reaction, but I don't want to. So then I say, what's the next action? Oh, the next action is to open my laptop. Just that, just open my laptop. The next action, whatever it might be, keep it small. Because social psychologists learned years ago that motivation, well, actually what they learned years ago is that attitude doesn't necessarily drive behavior. <laughs> behavior can drive attitude. And the same thing happens if we make progress on a goal, we feel better about it and that motivates us. So what's the next action is magical. And if you put the two of them together, implementation intentions and what's the next action, well, now you're getting closer to that Zen moment of, have you finished your rice? Then wash your bowl. You're not forcing yourself anymore. You're using what behavioral economists would say, a gentle nudge, right? You're just nudging yourself in that direction. Because hmm. when you try to force yourself to do things, what does the self do? It resists. <laughs> no way. You can't tell me what to do. <laughs> no. The crazy thing about that is I'm talking to myself, right? <laughs> but that's people. We are, we are really crazy that way. I'm trying to force myself to do something. Now, I'm just mm. going to nudge myself that, in that direction. So that's implementation intentions. When then? We could work with Peter Gallwitzer. But lay on top of that, and this is so powerful, and it could be life-changing right now if you want it to be. What's the next action? Use it all day long. What's the next action? And you do that action and you find, oh, okay, now I'm doing. And once I'm doing, ah, I'm not focused on my emotions anymore. I'm focused on doing. And the doing makes me feel good. And the progress makes me feel good. And even if I don't do a lot, it's not like I didn't do nothing at all. Those days where you do nothing at all, 
you go right down the rabbit hole. Yeah. So th that's, those are two really big uh, techniques or tricks or strategies that are really helpful to getting back on task. That's great because you enter sort of like loop. What do I need to do next? It feels good. Boom. What I didn't need to do next. It feels good because I'm getting closer to my goal and it's, it's sort of like a positive loop. It is. In fact, you know, most of the time we talk about the downward spiral in our lives, whether that be addiction or procrastination, but even the psychologists who wrote, wrote about originally progress fueling well-being, they called it the upward spiral because it does, it feeds on itself and we need that. That's what positive psychology is so much. And we hear that in positive psychology with the notion of broaden and build. You're, you're strengthening yourself. So you're broadening the positive emotions and progress can do that. What's the next action? When then? And if you keep that attitude, of course, it's moving your attention off your emotions and onto action. But, you know, if I want to lay another big strategy on you and, and, and you have time to work on these things, and you mentioned it already, emotional intelligence, I would argue that mindfulness meditation is very powerful in that regard. You know, we even have neuroscientific evidence to show that mindfulness meditation, even eight weeks of it, and I say we, I'm talking about the broader community. <laughs> this research came out of the University of Pittsburgh by a woman with the last name of Taren, T-A-R-E-N. -E and she demonstrated years ago that even eight weeks of mindfulness meditation actually shrunk the size of the amygdala, the volume of the amygdala. Now, what's important about that is that recently German colleagues have shown us that chronic procrastinators have enlarged amygdala volumes. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, the amygdala is the part of the limbic system that brings into memory, like when you're learning things, brings emotion to the table. Or you might think of it more as the fight or flight part of your brain, right? It's really encoding emotion. Now, if procrastinators are getting this amygdala hijack, the limbic system is taking over. That's why they're acting like a six-year-old. Mindfulness meditation, there's evidence to show that at the physiological level, we actually shrink the volume. But then from my perspective, not being a neuroscientist, I look at it as a development of volitional skills. So mindfulness meditation teaches me a skill that I can directly and gently move my attention to where I want it to be. If you've ever practiced mindfulness meditation, you know that oftentimes it's putting your attention on your, your breath and you realize, I can't do this. I keep thinking about everything else I have to do. <laughs> I keep thinking about this, that, and the other thing. Yes, of course. That's, that's monkey mind. That's what we're like. Our brain thinks and feels, thinks and feels. But if you gently bring your attention back over and over again, non-judgmentally, you build, you could say, a volitional muscle. So that when you face a task you don't want to do and your whole body's screaming, oh, this is so boring. Oh, I resent this. I can't stand this. It's so frustrating. Yep, that's true. I have all these emotions, but I can just gently bring my attention back. That's so powerful, right? So there's neuroscientific evidence to say it changes our brain and makes that easier. But at this, on the surface, without digging into our brain, we just know that, yeah, that's a strong volitional skill. It keeps me moving forward. So now we got three on the table, right? We've got implementation intentions, when then, and we've got what's the next action. And then we've got this backdrop of, gee, I could strengthen my volitional muscles by just practicing mindfulness meditation so I can bring my attention to where I want it to be. I don't want it to be over there on the temptation. And there's more if you'd like. Yeah, it's incredible. Before I started meditating, I didn't know that there was such a such a thing as concentrating. I just thought, okay, I'm going to stare here and this is concentrating. And then after a couple of months, I realized that concentration is actually like a muscle. You could put your brain in a certain way where you feel focused, you feel mm -hmm. that flow. And I just didn't know that was possible. Yes. And everything is a practice, right? This, these things don't develop overnight and they go away if we don't use them right? Use it or lose it. And so it's the same with something like yoga. You know, when you first do say a warrior pose and, and uh, your yoga instructor is saying you should have weight on your front foot, but you should have weight on your back foot too. You're thinking, how do I have weight on my back foot? I'm leaning forward. <laughs> and then after lots of practice, you realize, wow, I feel like my, I'm just grounded here. Well, that's right. That's what practice does. And so for those of you who have never 
you know, sat and just tried to do a bit of mindfulness, don't push it away. Give it a chance. You know, the joke is if you don't think you have enough time, then you need even more time, <laughs> of course. But, but yeah, you're absolutely right that these are these are things that we don't recognize and they are so powerful once you start to own them. They they give you they give you back your life in some ways, right? Yeah. Yeah. So for me though, here's another big piece of that. I love this author by the name of Parker Palmer, an amazing American educator. Uh, he's won all sorts of awards. He's written wonderful books. If you're looking, if you're an educator and you want to read a great book, The Courage to Teach, it was published back in 99, 98, I believe, but well worth a read. It's about fear in education and how it owns us. Well, fear owns us lots in life, right? The fear of failure and uh, all sorts of fears, fear of dying, whatever. But he has this most powerful statement in that book, and it's one of my personal mantras, and I, I owe it to him. I may have fear, but I need not be my fear. And so I can say, I may have boredom, but I need not be my boredom. I can have resentment, but I not, need not be my resentment. That is so freeing. And then he adds, because I can work from some other part of my inner landscape. And my inner landscape is much more complex than just that one emotion. And you see, for some people, rather than that micro technique of what's the next action or implementation tensions, you might resonate more to this bigger picture thing of, yeah, I have this, I don't have to be this. Because everyone's a little different and your entry point can be a little different. So I offer that up as a, a really important place where I spend time mentally when I feel that I just don't know how to get going. And I want you to sort of expand on that because it's. I feel that it's very important knowing that you do have this inclination, this want to giving in, to feel good, to doing what's easy. But we also have that other mental space which we could use to sort of guide our attention towards what we do want to do. Sure. I'm going to go at that in two ways. First, I'm going to just mention that it was Ellen Bratlavsky, uh, Diane Tice, and Roy Baumeister who wrote a really interesting paper that they entitled, part of the title was Giving In to Feel Good. You know, I take that from them. You know, that's, they provided this perspective on the priority of mood repair. And that's where I've really hung my hat to say, that's the way to understand procrastination. Not my work, their work. But when you start thinking about, um, well, let's go back to, repeat your question again, if you would, because I, I, I wanted to first explain that, but then I wanted to take it into uh, another direction, which I got, I got, oh no, I know what it is. Okay. So one of the, one of my graduate students who's now finished her PhD and doing some amazing work on, on the human mind and imagination, she did work on imagining our future self. Now, down at UCLA, Hal Hirschfield's done some amazing work this way, where he's had people think about future self. And lo and behold, if you think about your future self at my age in your 60s, and you're not in your 60s, lo and behold, you'll save more for retirement if I gave you <laughs> some money. Because <laughs> you'd say, yeah, that old guy that I'm looking at, you know, he, he needs cash. Um, and so that was interesting to us. We thought, yeah, you know, changing uh, your perspective and, and imagining future self changes what present self does. So Eve Marie Blouin Houdon, she did a really interesting study where she had students imagine themselves later in the term. And when they imagine themselves later in the term, they develop more empathy for that person. And having more empathy for that person uh, was related to a decrease in procrastination really fascinating in the sense that yeah present self and this is what you were speaking to present self wants to give in to feel good it's that misregulation of emotion but if you can bring future self a little closer then present self goes whoa wait a minute that's me in the future i don't look so happy there right <laughs> and and then you develop empathy for future self in fact when i give public talks on this i often show a cartoon of homer simpson where Marge says to Homer, you know, homie, someday these kids are going to be grown and you're going to regret not spending more time with them. And Homer in his infinite wisdom says, yeah, that's a, a problem for future Homer. Man, <laughs> I don't envy that guy. You know, and, and, and that's why we laugh because Homer gets it. 
But that's what's so powerful about this is that Hal Hirschfield's work shows it so clearly. The behavioral economists, people like Richard Taylor at the University of Chicago, who won the Nobel Prize for, you know, showing how we are more like Homer Simpson than we are like Homo economicus. It, it, what it should do for all of us is let us see our common humanity, right? That to be a little squirrely, like I keep saying we are, that's the human condition. So we have to forgive ourselves and know that it's human nature to want to feel good now. But then to do these things, to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to think about future self. Oh, yeah, future self's going to be so screwed if I do that right now. So what can I do instead? Well, I could recognize I have this emotion. I don't need to be this emotion. I can ask myself, what's the next action? I can create implementation intentions. You see all these things fit together. So on the one level, I understand the psychology of it. Yeah, it's human nature to want to give in to feel good. It's human nature to discount future rewards. It's human nature to think about future self like a stranger. Now, knowing all that, I think I can beat that. Yeah, I can, I can do things now to win. And winning means living the life I want to win, live. It's, it feels like a constant battle and struggle between the rational mind and then our emotional reptilian brain, uh, as they call it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, we try to put it there. And I'm even, even the, earliest Aristotelian model showed the the uh, chariot driver and the team of horses, you know, trying to control the wild beasts. And Freud had the same notion, you know, the id versus the ego or super ego. And now neuroscience has the limbic system against the prefrontal cortex. But, they, you know, we are all one person. And I think we, we have to uh, accept the comings and goings of our emotions. So that's where this mindfulness, this non-judgmental attitude comes in to say, yeah, of course I have emotions and I have a strong emotions, but I don't have to let them own me. But you're absolutely right. We have all these emotions. Um, and that's where, unfortunately, procrastination has its home, right? Uh, we we want to be like, I have children that are 13 and 15. Despite being an old guy, I started very late in life. Talk about procrastination. Whoa, I didn't start till I was 50. But, you know, I will say to them, it's time to shovel snow like we had to today. I don't feel like it. No, no, no. I didn't ask you how you felt. I said, it's time to shovel snow, right? And, and, and yet, as adults, we, we do the same thing. It's time to do my work, but I don't feel like it. Well, I didn't ask you how you felt. It's time to do your work. So the struggle, the struggle you speak of, is really just embracing a very childish attitude, right? It, it's, and, and when, okay, and let me take it another way, because some people might go, are you calling me childish? Mm, yes and no. You know, between the only thing that you and I have in life that is truly a non-renewable resource is time. And you and I don't know how much we're going to get of that. I, we started this interview by me saying, yeah, last year at this time, I thought I was checking out. I had a cancer. We didn't have a prognosis yet. I just knew it was metastatic because the primary tumor wasn't where the other tumors were. The other tumors were in my lymph. I thought, I'm done. So I thought my time was up. And yet none of us know when that is. So I think that's why in every world religion, to waste time, this notion of sloth, is a sin. Right? It doesn't matter what religion you're speaking of. We don't have to just think of Judeo-Christian. We can think of many world traditions. And it's a deeply existential issue that re reflects that human beings are bound by time. We're born and we die. And in between, we have to decide, what is it I'm doing with my life? And as you were talking about in the founding of your podcast, both of you decided that, yeah, you weren't going where you wanted to be going. You wanted to change direction. How do we do that? Well, recognizing that time is limited and that this is not a dress rehearsal, this is your life, is powerfully motivating, right? And, and, and so I want to go back to what I was joking about when I say we can be childish. Well, when I work with young people in particular, I try to develop in them a sense of agency. This is your life. Like, own it. Like, be, be sure you're the author of your own life. Not so that you're a better employee necessarily, not so that you make more widgets, but that, that you spent the day that you wanted to spend the day doing. So you don't have these regrets because you don't want to die with those regrets. And because this is your life 
and you don't get today back again. In fact, if I can do this while we're, because I'm, I'm not sharing my screen, but I, uh, I did a talk for university students in Canada, uh, uh, quite a distance for where, from where I am right now, last week. And at the same time I was about to give the talk, there was a piece published in University Affairs, which is a magazine about universities in Canada. And the author, Carrie Banks, used a quote from the philosopher Francis Bacon. And it was so moving to me, I put it in at the end of my slides and my host who had invited me to speak, she said, people wrote to me and said they cried when they read that last slide. So I wanna share it with you because it speaks to all the things I was just saying, Antonio. This, this is Francis Bacon, the English philosopher. And he says, begin doing what you want to do now. We are not living in eternity. We have only this moment, sparkling like a star in our hand and melting like a snowflake. Now, for those who in your audience are more poetic at heart than social scientific, who don't want a tip or technique, then that, that quote is powerfully moving. You know, that last line, sparkling like a star in our hand, which is what our lives are, and melting like a snowflake, which is also the truth. And this is something that Parker Palmer often speaks of. The opposite of one great truth is another great truth. And that's why that quote is so powerful, right? Yeah, so all of these things, when you asked me that question that I almost forgot, this giving in to feel good and the limbic system taking over, yeah, that's the human condition. And we've been faced with that since we have been human beings, homo sapien. Now, certainly, Social science and neuroscience is bringing us different perspectives on this, but this is not a new dilemma. And the dilemma has been faced by philosophers and people who have practiced meditation in different faiths, and that we need to embrace those things as we move forward. Yeah, so that's a long answer to your question, but a complete one. Some of us are really stingy with our money, yet we waste our time like if we had infinite, infinite amounts. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's another great game to play in your head. If every day was a dollar, would this would this be the way I'd spend this dollar? Yeah. And for, but you know, and this is the thing, all of us are different in the way we learn. All of those are different in the way we find a a hook. And so for some people that will be the hook. Here's another hook. Mark Twain has been quoted as saying, "If your job is to eat a frog, then it's best to eat it first thing in the morning. And if your job is to eat two frogs, it's best to eat the biggest one first. Now, it's a wonderful expression. And in fact, there's at least one book out there that's called Eat That Frog. And it's about procrastination. Uh, I think it's by Brian Tracy. And it's a wonderful title and, and, and a great way to title a book on procrastination. And when I've worked with people uh, in consulting roles, I've actually put little frogs out on the tables. And they think, what's with this squirrely professor and these little colorful frogs? But later on, I get emails that say, that frog sits on my desk and I ask myself, what's my frog today? What's that tough job I need to get done first, right? So there's another powerful hook for many people to say, yeah, eat that frog or what's the next action or let's make an implementation intention or I can have an emotion, not be an emotion. All of these are powerful tools. These frogs in the morning, first thing, because in the morning is when we have the most willpower and the most motivation. Yes, typically that's the case. You know, the the um, limited resource model of the willpower has taken a real hit in psychology. Uh, some of these studies couldn't be replicated, but I firmly believe that Baumeister's colleagues who have developed the paradigm, they still have a, a real issue there that most of us know the phenomenon of exhausting ourselves and feeling like we got nothing left. But it may have been overplayed about, overplayed about how uh, limited a resource willpower can be, but certainly we all have to act when we know our willpower is strongest. Some of us, that's later in the day, but for most of us, that's first thing. But the other thing about doing things first thing is that then the rest of the day looks just easy because you'll otherwise in the back of your head, you're going, oh yeah, I got to do that. I don't want to. I, oh yeah, I got to do that. I, I think that's got to be the worst thing about procrastination, that you stew in your own juices. A lot of procrastinators get their stuff done and actually do a good job. It's not like they fail, but they hate themselves. They go, why do I have to stay up all night doing my work, right? Yeah, it's, it's a, a powerful thing that way. So, yeah, eating the frog is about 
taking advantage of that. And, and let's play on that one more bit and that we have good self during the day and we have not so good self. And when you have a good self, when you're at powerful self, self that seems to could rule the world, then you got to pre-commit the not so strong self to action. So here's a common example of a pre-commitment device. Many people will say, I just can't get up in the morning. Well, I said, what about setting alarm? Yeah, but as soon as the alarm goes off, I hit snooze. I said, okay, when you're feeling like good self, and this is not my trick, this is many other people's, put the alarm on the other side of the room. So now you just can't get up and you just can't roll over and hit the snooze. You have to walk over across the room. Good self or strong self has committed weak self ahead of time, right? And in fact, Joe Heath from the University of Toronto and Joel Anderson from Utrecht University, both philosophers, have a wonderful notion of extended will. In other words, don't rely only on your own willpower. Use others to help you. And then that's another powerful technique. So, for example, I might not feel like exercising today, but if I made a, a date with you to exercise, I'd never let you down. Like just my nature. I know that about myself. I wouldn't phone you up and say, no, I, I'm too tired. <laughs> I'd be there. So if I know that about myself, I make the commitment. So find ways to make the environment work for you. And for many of us, of course, that is take your phone, shut it off, lock in the box somewhere because that thing owns you and you're not going to get anything done while it's around. Yeah. It, it's incredible. The, the snoozing problem. And, um, uh, I was talking to Sebastian about it like a couple of weeks ago and I told him what you just told me, just leave it in the bathroom, have the door open and you're going to have to get up. <laughs> and then he did it and he got up, he snoozed it and then he went back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. And in fact, other people will say, yeah, that's a good idea. And then they procrastinate on doing it. We call that second order procrastination. You know, you can like people will listen to this today and go, those are good ideas. And then they'll procrastinate on doing them. Yeah. Like, you know, we, There's no cure. In fact, I often joke when I'm with my students, I say, I wish I could just come up, put my hand on your head and say, heal. Right? <laughs> like we all, we all wish someone could fix it that way, but that, that's not the human condition. And in fact, let's go back to my first story. That's what I desperately wanted when I had the cancer, right? Now, fortunately, with some things, people can help you. But with this kind of condition, we're talking about healing ourselves, right? We're looking at how do we create the life that we want to have? But poor Sebastian, get that phone out of your bedroom or get that uh, alarm clock out of your bedroom. Or the other better thing is to set more than one too, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed from everything that you've said is that we all have a specific way to learning how to beat procrastination. So there's no like this silver bullet. We all could learn in different ways and could implement one strategy and it might work another strategy and it might work so what roadmap can you give us in order to guide the person depending on their personality towards maybe what could work for them or where could they start right. well personality is an interesting thing if you're a person who if i walked into your room i'd see it in total disarray like it's a mess we would call that the behavioral residue of personality, residue, you know, garbage of, and, and I'd say you're not very conscientious. In other words, you're not very dutiful or organized. You're not very self-disciplined because look at your place is a mess. And, and that's one way you can assess personality. Uh, so if that's your, if that's you, because you've mentioned personality in here, I would say that you're going to have to act out of character quite a bit to do any of these things because it's not typical of you to be organized or dutiful. So that's going to be hard for you. And if you're an impulsive person, like you just do things on the snap of a finger, well, you're in trouble then too, because as soon as you get a feeling, you're gone. Like you're going to have to learn to count to 10, right? And the last one in terms of personality would be if you are a, a perfectionist, but a certain flavor of perfectionist, you don't just do a good job because you like to do a good job. You're doing a good job because you're trying to live up to other people's standards. If that's you, Well, that's another problem. You need, you're starting to get the perfect storm here. An impulsive, disorganized perfectionist is going to have a lot of problems with procrastination because here, when you're trying to live up to other people's standards, you, it makes you feel bad. 
And there's the beginning of the whole story, isn't it? I feel bad. I want to feel good. So I find something that I think is going to make me feel good, but that's short-term mood repair and it comes back to shoot me in the foot. So yeah, personality plays a role here, but you asked a bigger question than that. You said, so we're, we could all start in a different place. Where should we start? Well, how do you need to eat an elephant? You know, one mouthful at a time, right? And I'm sorry if that offends you. We're not trying to eat elephants on the show. You know, how do you eat anything that's big? How do you get an elephant in the, in the car? Never mind. The, the thing is that you have to, everyone has to start at ground zero, which is to recognize that it's a coping response. Procrastination is an avoidance coping response to try to make ourselves feel better right now. And it's a learned coping response. It's not that you're bad at managing time. And if you start there, you can recognize that, hmm, there are other coping responses I could use besides this one. What could those be? And now you're starting to answer your own questions. And then you might even say, oh yeah, what did I learn from that podcast? Well, the best way to get moving right now is to ask myself, what's the next action? The best way to get myself moving tomorrow is to set an implementation intention. The best way to organize my week is to think about future self because then I won't put everything at the end of the week. So I think some of it's temporal. I have to set the context up so that it works for me. Make the environment afford me success so I don't have distractions around me, so that I, I, I have friends helping me, whatever it takes to set me up to succeed. Make the things that I find hard to do easier to do. Make the things that I want to do easily more difficult to do. And you did that with Sebastian by saying, put it in the bathroom, right? <laughs> you managed to get up anyhow. So we are all going to start in a different place, but we all have to start with the almost where we did today to recognize that procrastination is not a time management issue. It's an emotion management issue. And you can learn to manage your emotions in different ways. That's very beautiful, Tim. Is there anything else that you want to say or anything you want to promote specifically? Nothing to promote. Um, you know, procrastination.ca is my website. It's, it's, I'm not selling you anything there, but if you want to hear, I started podcasting in 2006. Uh, and this was when most of us didn't understand what a good microphone was. So if you go to my podcast, you just know the first few years are awful in terms of audio quality. Great content, though. I interviewed some pretty amazing people. And so if, if you really like the topic, you can certainly do that. And I've written uh, a blog for many years for Psychology Today. Because of the circumstances I've been in, I haven't been writing or podcasting lately. I might go back to it. So that's procrastination.ca. Not trying to sell you anything. That's all free, right? You can see my research. You can deep dive into the podcast if you want. But I warn you, you know, you've got a wonderful philosopher emeritus. He's an emeritus professor at Stanford University by the name of John Perry. And he's written a wonderful book called The Art of Procrastination. He's just a wonderful man. But he says in his own book, you know, you can do a lot of reading about procrastination to procrastinate. So be careful about that. You know, what are you doing? I'm trying to figure myself out. Why don't you do your work instead? So just don't do a deep dive. And, and I guess the last thing I'd want to say is that we did a study that we published in 2010. A good friend of mine at Carleton who knows lots about forgiveness. And it's the last chapter in that book that you've been talking about on forgiveness. He said, we should do a study on forgiveness and procrastination. I said, oh, we can, Michael, but I think it's going to be forgive and forget. And he said, oh, don't you be so sure. And darned if he wasn't right. To make a long story short, because I think you've probably read that chapter, that what we found is that people who procrastinated and forgave themselves procrastinated less in the future. And, and this is only one study, mind you but the pattern is really informative. And the people who procrastinated at time one, but didn't forgive themselves, still procrastinated at time two. I said, Michael, how does that, why? Why is the forgiveness working? And he said, well, what would happen if uh, between Antonio and Sebastian, there was a transgression, like one of them didn't do the work he promised? Well, I'd imagine that uh, Sebastian would avoid Antonio and vice versa. He says, yep. Now, what if Antonio forgave Sebastian? What would be the motivation then? Well, it'd be approach. They'd be willing to be together. He said, yeah, exactly. But you see, with procrastination, the transgression is against the self. So unless you forgive yourself, you got all this negative emotion associated with the task. So 
what I'd leave as a final word is that I've talked about our common humanity in some ways. We need self-compassion and even self-forgiveness at times. If you're on a journey, and this is maybe why you're listening to Rebound as a podcast, and you're learning all sorts of wonderful things and you're trying to implement them in your life, you're going to have bad days and you're going to screw up. And you have to forgive yourself and go back to fundamentals and try again. But if you don't forgive yourself, it's going to be less likely that you'll try again because you're going to build up all these negative emotions, even emotions so powerful like shame, like I'm a bad person or guilt. I didn't do it. You don't need to go there. You know, it's human nature to fail. In Canada, but you'll know this name, one of our famous Canadians who died in 2016 was Leonard Cohen, a famous songwriter and poet. In one of his songs, he says, uh, forget your perfect offerings. Everything has a crack in it. That's how the light gets in, right? And, and that's another one of my personal mantras. Everything has a crack in it. We're all human and you're gonna make mistakes Forgive yourself and move on. So that's one thing we never got to. But I think it's really important, particularly for people who may be struggling and are listening to Rebound to gain control of their lives again. 